On the eve of Christmas, a young woman was abducted from the apartment where she lived with her boyfriend. An unknown criminal tied up the young man and took the young woman out through the back door, disappearing without a trace. The police were unable to identify the perpetrator and the case went cold for 36 years until an unexpected truth came to light. Leslie McRae was born on April 14, 1968, in Jacksonville, Florida. She was kind-hearted, determined, outgoing, loved to have fun, had a sharp mind, and a great sense of humor. Leslie grew up in a loving family, but was particularly close to her four-year younger cousin, Joey. Despite living in different cities, the girls tried to spend as much time together as possible. Leslie even considered moving to her city when she turned 18. After graduating from high school at the age of 17, Leslie enrolled at the University of North Florida, dreaming of building a career in the modeling industry. She moved out of her parents' house and into an apartment complex with her 21-year-old boyfriend, Edgar McQuarrie. On the night of December 24, 1985, they were sleeping in their apartment when Edgar woke up around 3 a.m. to a noise. To his horror, he saw a man with a knife above their bed. The unknown criminal tied Edgar's hands and feet with ties, threatening him with a weapon to prevent him from resisting. He then tied up Leslie in the same way and took her out through the back door of the apartment. Edgar, still tied up, could only watch in horror as the kidnapper took Leslie away. It took him three hours to free his hands, and around 6 a.m., he called the police. Detectives arrived at their apartment, took Edgar's statement, and began searching for Leslie. Considering that the room was almost pitch black at the time of the abduction, Edgar could not see the perpetrator's face or any other distinguishing features except for brown hair. The police also did not know what kind of vehicle the kidnapper had used, although it was evident that he had used some form of transportation to abduct Leslie. While detectives were trying to find witnesses and examining the street, they received a call at their station. Three hours after the kidnapping, a man went out for a morning run and noticed a female body lying in a ditch next to the road, eight kilometers away from Leslie's apartment. The investigators arrived at the scene and immediately identified the young woman. Her body was covered in various injuries. Some of her clothing was torn or missing. Medical experts determined that the young woman had received more than 20 sharp object wounds and there were also many bruises on her body. In addition, the killer had subjected the victim to violence and experts were able to extract his biological material. Considering that DNA analysis was not yet used in those years, this evidence could not help the police identify a suspect. There were no other useful clues at the scene so the investigators decided to focus on examining the victim's apartment. Soon, they had serious doubts about what had happened that night. According to the victim's boyfriend, the criminal had quietly entered the apartment, but no signs of a break-in were found, and there were no signs of a struggle in the rooms. In addition, the back door through which Leslie was allegedly taken out was covered in cobwebs and no fingerprints were found on it. There were no shoe prints despite a thick layer of dust around it. All of this suggested that the boyfriend's story may have been fabricated and in that case, an obvious question arose. Does he have anything to do with the murder? However, this version had its nuances. The investigators doubted that the boyfriend could have taken out and killed his girlfriend, then returned to the apartment and called the police. 
Experts suggested that her body was dumped on the street after Edgar called 911, so he was no longer considered a suspect. Over the next few months, the detectives tried to find new leads, but each time they hit a dead end. As a result, the investigation was finally suspended in 1986. The criminal's biological material, which was the only serious evidence in this case, could not help the investigators at that time, and they hoped that in the future, this clue would lead them to the killer. For many years, this case sat gathering dust in archives, but Leslie's relatives never lost hope of finding the culprit. They reached out to various authorities and gathered information themselves that could be useful in solving the case. However, their resources were limited, so they were unable to find any new leads. In 2010, Leslie's mother, Sarah Adams, was diagnosed with a serious nervous system disease that practically robbed her of her ability to speak. Despite this, she continued to maintain contact with investigators through notes. After that, Leslie's cousin Joey became the most active in the search for the truth. Although she and her family lived two hours away from Jacksonville, she regularly traveled there to speak with investigators or help Leslie's mother. However, attempts to reach out to the police practically led nowhere. Detectives were not eager to reopen the investigation, considering the lack of new evidence. Additionally, they were occupied with ongoing criminal cases, so they were in no rush to take on a decades-old murder case. As a result, Joey began to accuse the detectives of being negligent in the early stages of the investigation, or even covering up the perpetrator. She even suggested that the killer may have bribed investigators, but she had no evidence to support this theory. Joey also regularly gave interviews to local news channels, trying to draw public attention to the case. She recalled the time spent with her older sister and described Leslie as a cheerful and positive person. She also regretted that her two children never got to know what a wonderful aunt Leslie could have been to them. In late 2018, her relatives' persistent efforts produced the first results. They contacted representatives of the Cold Case Files Project and they became interested in Leslie's case. This nonprofit organization, which began in 2015, focuses on unsolved murders in which police have been unable to find the perpetrators. The organization collects and disseminates information, engages in dialogue with investigators and the media. In addition, they provide support to the victim's relatives, advising them on communication with the police and journalists. The organization's employees posted information about Leslie's murder on various resources, trying to attract as much attention as possible to the case. In such cases, when investigators have not been able to solve the case, public interest can play a key role. Firstly, the more people hear about this crime, the more chances there are that potential witnesses to the events will be among them. Sometimes people, without realizing it, may have seen or heard something that could lead the police to the killer. Secondly, under pressure from the public and the media, the chances of detectives reopening the investigation increased. Throughout this time, they had the perpetrator's biological material, but to study it, they needed to reopen the case, which police officers often do not do due to a lack of personnel or funding. The organization worked together with Leslie's relatives for several months, and they really managed to draw attention to this case. They wrote in the news and talked about it in reports, and in June 2019, representatives of a popular local TV channel contacted the family. They offered to record a large-scale interview in which relatives could talk about Leslie and their years-long attempts to seek the truth. Her cousin and mother accepted the offer 
and met with journalists. They told them about who Leslie was as a person, showed her photos, and were dismayed by the fact that the police had not been investigating the case for over 30 years. In addition, in the interview, relatives mentioned they believed that the boys Leslie mentioned were her killers, and in their opinion, her story about a man with a knife was not trustworthy. The boy himself could have killed her, but the journalist decided to cut this moment out, as Edgar was not a suspect in this case, and there was no evidence against him. Representatives of the TV channel contacted the sheriff's office, hoping to get some additional information, but the police refused to comment. They referred to rules that prohibited them from discussing with journalists cases that were not currently under investigation. Leslie's family was disappointed with this outcome, but they were not going to give up. Joey continued to write letters to investigators demanding that the case be reopened and ultimately it paid off. The family was able to organize a meeting with law enforcement representatives and detectives indicated their intention to revive the investigation. The Leslie family was interviewing again and the police began to re-examine the evidence. In April 2020, they sent biological material from the victim's body to a laboratory, and soon experts extracted a DNA profile, which was entered into the FBI's national database and immediately received a match. Almost 35 years later, the investigators finally had a possible killer's name. He was 58-year-old David Nelson Austin. After studying his biography, the detectives found many interesting moments. His DNA was in the FBI database, not just by chance. Since 1991, the man had been serving a sentence for two sexual crimes committed in 1988 and 1990. At that time, he lived in Michigan, where he moved from Florida. Detectives determined that at the time of Leslie's death, he was living in Jacksonville and was 24 years old. Two months before the murder, he attacked a mentally disabled young woman and attempted to assault her, but he failed. The man was arrested, but the justice system treated his act very lightly. Austin received no serious punishment and remained free. In addition to this, he had a whole series of less serious crimes, including drug possession, disturbing the peace, and more. The detectives had no doubt that he was behind Leslie's murder and began preparing the case for trial. Gathering all the necessary materials, in early 2021, they went to the Michigan prison to interrogate Austin for the first time. The man denied his involvement but no one was going to believe him on his word. Investigators took his DNA sample to directly compare it with the biological material found on the victim's body. This had to be done as part of the standard procedure, and the result was expected, a complete match. In August 2021, Austin was officially charged with the murder of Leslie. Since then, detectives have been working to have him transferred from Michigan to Florida, where the crime was committed. The need for transfer was due to one simple fact. Florida had the death penalty, unlike Michigan, and Austin could have received that sentence for the murder of Leslie. The process took a year, until September 2022, when he was finally transferred to a correctional facility in Florida. He is currently behind bars awaiting trial and investigators have no doubt about his guilt. The only way for the perpetrator to avoid the death penalty is to make a deal with the prosecution and confess to the murder in exchange for another life sentence. During a press conference, investigators admitted that Austin was never a suspect in the case and was never questioned. According to them, the man did not leave any clues that the police could use to pursue him, 
and DNA analysis was impossible at that time. Furthermore, his DNA was only added to the FBI database in 1991, six years after the murder. Joey also gave an interview in which she said that she had always believed that Leslie's boyfriend was the killer. It was only after investigators revealed the real perpetrator's name that she realized that Edgar was also a victim in the story. It is expected that she will be the main witness in the trial. Leslie's mother said she forgave her daughter's killer, which surprised her family members, but they all respected her decision. Interestingly, Austin has a son named Owen, whom he has never met. Nevertheless, they regularly communicated via email. Journalists contacted Owen and learned that he was shocked by the charges against his father. Austin himself wrote to him about it, adding that he had nothing to do with this crime. At the same time, his son was well aware of other criminal episodes from his father's life, but continued to communicate with him. Austin's trial is expected to begin soon. If there are no bureaucratic delays, he may receive his sentence in a few months. Despite the fact that the truth has finally come out, the victim's relatives still blame investigators for negligence, believing that if they had periodically reopened this case, the perpetrator's identity could have been established in the early 90s, rather than 30 years later. Feel free to share your thoughts on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching.